Welcome back to chapter 17. This chapter, we're going to be going from probability to the next part of our uh, our year when we're going to be looking at um, taking samples and the inference and how we can, what we can say about the population from those samples. So this chapter, we're going to be looking at sampling distribution models. Um, there's a bunch in here, but it's really the same thing just twice because we're going to look at proportions and we're going to look at sample means. Um, some of the vocab gets a little bit confusing because we'll be talking about sampling distributions as well as distributions of samples, which are two different things. Um, and um, we'll also be talking about the central limit theorem, which is super, super important. So the um, the first thing is, what is a sampling distribution? A sampling distribution happens when, or it, it's what happens when you take every sample from a population of a specific size. So if we wanted a sampling distribution of size uh, 10 of the population of the high school, it would need every single combination of 10 people in the high school. And then we'd be looking at what is the mean of those or what is the proportion of that. But we'd be looking at the specific statistic from each of those samples. So um, <clears throat> the central limit theorem for sample proportions. Um, so rather than showing the real repeated samples, imagine what would happen if we actually took that many samples, right? We're not going to take samples of every single group of 10 students from the high school. That would be an absolutely ridiculous number of samples. In fact, if there are, um, if there are say 1400 people in the high school and we're taking groups of 10, that would give us like 7.7 .7 times 10 to the 24th possible samples. So not feasible to take all of those. So that's why we would imagine what would happen if that was actually doing it. Now imagine what would happen if we looked at the sample proportion for these samples or sample mean. So if we're talking about the students, we could be looking at the mean height. So we take a sample of 10 students, we get their average height. We take another sample of 10 students, we get their average height. We take another sample of 10 students, we get their average height. And we do this for all many, many, many samples. The histogram we get, if we could do it for, again, that's all the possible samples. Right now it's talking about proportions. It's gonna be the same for mean, but it's all the possible samples, specific all. That's called the sampling distribution of the proportions because we're talking about proportions right now. Um, so what would the histogram of all the sample proportions look like? Um, it's going to be centered at the true proportion. Um, and as far as the shape goes, uh, we could simulate a whole bunch of them, um, but it's going to turn out it's going to be unimodal and symmetric. And more specifically, it's going to be normal. So that table A or the Z table, the Z score, all that stuff that we just did at last chapter, we did it at the beginning of the year, we're gonna continue doing it because we will be looking at sample distributions for basically the rest of the year. Um, and we're able to use the normal model. Um, and so uh, the modeling how they, modeling how sample proportions vary from sample to sample is one of the most powerful ideas we'll see in the course. Um, and that's true with sample means as well. Um, a sample distribution model for how it varies from sample to sample allows us to look at that variation and see um, what that probability is that we would get something with that variation in that model or in that um, interval. So it's the same thing we're looking at with a single sample. In the past, we've had, all right, what's the probability of getting one thing and it being here? Now we're going to be looking at what's the probability of getting a group of 10 and having their average be in this range. 
Um, we're going to see how that plays into um, what happens with that normal distribution in the range here in just a minute. So to use a normal model, we need a mean and standard deviation. Those are the two things that define the normal model. Um, for the mean, we get the proportion. Like, what is the proportion? Um, so if we were to say roll a dice, like one die, the mean is going to be a 3.5. And so that would be the center of our, um, of our uh, normal distribution. The standard deviation, um, when we have proportions, it's super easy because it's the mean time or the, the probability of success times the probability of failure divided by the sample size and then square root. That's what, that's what this is. The standard deviation is the probability of success or the, it's the proportion times one minus the proportion divided by N. Um, and then, so the normal model, remember it's defined by the mean and the standard deviation. So this is gonna give us a normal curve. It's gonna be centered at P, the proportion, um, and then the standard deviation will be the square root of P times Q over N. Now something we're gonna see here in a little bit is as our sample size increases, we divide by bigger and bigger numbers, the standard deviation will decrease. However, it's not a linear thing. In order to decrease, like to cut the standard deviation by two, to divide it by two, we'd have to increase the sample size by four because of the whole square root thing. Um, so this is what that would look like. We have the normal distribution. We have the mean is at P, that's that proportion. Um, and then the, um, one standard deviation, two standard deviations, three, and backwards. The 95, the 68, 95, 99.7 rule would apply to this. But again, that's just kind of those, those little estimates for one, two, and three standard deviations. Throw it in to find your z-score and then take it to that table A or the z-table. Um, same thing, just some places, like in the back of the book, it's called z-table but unlike the AP sheet, it's called table A. Um, <clears throat> so because we have a normal model, there's 95% of the values are gonna be within the two standard deviations. Um, so if we gave, if we got a proportion of 20, um, 20 samples, we could see that we, 95% of the time, that proportion is going to be within two standard deviations of that mean. Um, and that is what is sampling error. Notice a lot of times people think sampling error and they're thinking of bias or something like that. It's not actually an error. It's just the variability. Every sample is not going to be the same. Um, so it's, it's variability. Oh, there we go. Sampling variability. But a lot of times it's called sample error. We see it in like newspapers and stuff. It's like, oh, it's like 53% of people think this plus or minus 3%. That's the sampling variability. It's not that, oh, they made a mistake. It's just that that distance they expected to be in that area. Um, so how good is the normal model? Well, it gets better with the bigger sample you have. Um, how big of a sample do you need? We'll look at that in a minute. Um, but generally speaking, the bigger the sample size, the better the normal model. Um, but we always have, have to make assumptions and have conditions. Um, so things that have to happen, the independence. Um, each of the values have to be independent of each other. Uh, randomization. The sample has to be an SRS, simple random sample of the population. Remember, a simple random sample is basically like drawing names from a hat. It's where every group has an equal chance of being chosen. Um, the 10% condition, the sample size must be no bigger than 10% of the population. 
um, which sounds kind of weird because I said the bigger the sample, the better it is. Well, that's even true even after it gets bigger than 10% of the population. What happens though is that when your sample size approaches the population, the standard deviation calculation breaks down a bit um, because it's not going to deviate. Like if you had the entire population, if you had a census, there would be no standard deviation. Like that would be the true proportion. Um, and so that's really all that happens when your sample size gets too big is that, that the variability or the variation formulas break down. Um, and so then we have a couple more. The sample size must be large enough. And then the sample size has to be big enough so that we have um, number of successes and number of failures of at least 10. Um, so it's the same thing with the binomial using that as a normal um, because it's this is actually kind of the same. Um, this, it's the next step. So we need at least to at least expect 10 successes and 10 failures. Um, so here, as I mentioned, the 10% and success failure, failure condition seem to be at conflict with each other. Um, so if you're at about 50-50, if your proportion of success is 0.5, you only need about 20. But the further away from 0.5 you get, the bigger sample you need. Um, generally speaking, you're not going to get close to that population. It's not going to even be close to 10%. If you're looking, a lot of times with proportions, especially, we're looking at things that can be repeated infinitely. Um, rolling dice, you can roll dice infinite number of times. There's no sample size that's going to be big enough to get you to that 10%. Um, and then a lot of times, even your, your population is going to be huge. If your population is not really big, then it's almost better to take that census in the first place. Um, so really, we only really need to be careful about that. Um, no larger than 10% of the population. If we're dealing with a really small population. Um, so, cause generally speaking, it's, it's way bigger. Um, and as I said, it's, um, if it's bigger than that, we just need different methods to analyze the data and those methods exist. We just don't get to them in this class. Um, so we need a big enough sample, but not too large. Um, no, and there we go. So generally speaking, the population is going to be way bigger than 10 times the sample size. Um, so the proportion is not just a computation from a set of raw data. Uh, we know it's now a variable in and of itself. Um, and that is um, the distributions of sampling distribution model for proportions. Again, we're going to talk about means in a second. Um, the uh, um, like a spoiler is it's basically the same. Um, and we never actually find the sample distribution models because it would require taking every possible sample of that sample size, which if we're looking at something like rolling dice, which has an infinite population, it's not even possible regardless of how much we try. So um, since we never actually take them, we don't make a histogram because we don't have the data. Um, so we'll imagine or simulate them. So taking sampling distribution, um, sampling distributions is important because it's taking us from finding the probability which of a single thing to looking at if we take this sample, what can we say about the population from this sample? And so it's kind of that that step into that next part of our our uh, curriculum. Um, <clears throat> so. Provide that the sample distributions are independent, sample size is large enough, sampling distribution of p hat, which is that sample proportion, is modeled by a normal model. The mean is p, that population proportion, and the standard deviation is the square root of p q over n, where q is 1 minus p. Um, these are both in the AP formula sheet, by the way. However, they don't usually use q. They use 1 minus p. 
Um, so what about quantitative data? I've said that it's basically the same for means. Well, so proportions summarize categorical variables, um, but we can use this for means as well for quantitative variables. Um, so like any statistic computed from a random sample, the sample mean also has sampling distribution, um, and we can use simulation to get the sense of what that can look like. So here we roll dice 10,000 times, and these are the values that we get. The average is going to be about 3.5. Um, here we can see, so the histogram from one to two, that would be getting a one, two to three would be getting a three, three to four would be getting a, or two to three would be getting a two, three to four would be getting a three, six to seven would be getting a six, right? Because we're not actually going to roll something between six and seven. All right, so that's just one dice and recording what we get on it. Notice it's basically uniform, right? As we would should expect it would be, we'd get about the same numbers of one, two, three, four, five, and sixes. A little bit of variability there. Well, if we roll two dice and we found the mean value, so we roll a one and a four, the mean value is going to be a 2.5, one plus four divided by two. So we do that a thousand times and we get the two dice average. What about three dice? Roll it 10,000 times, we get that three dice average. Notice we have very few ones and sixes on both of these, because in order to get an average of one, you have to roll a pair of ones or three ones. In order to get an average of six, you have to roll two or three sixes, depending on the model. Well, let's do it with more dice. So if we take five dice and average it, notice now we have basically zero ones or sixes because rolling five ones or five sixes is pretty unlikely. We're going to roll stuff in the middle. Um, rolling 20 dice, notice there we don't even have like twos or fives on that one because in order to get a two, you have to roll a lot of ones and twos um, with maybe a couple things that are just a little bit bigger. And same thing with sixes and fives. So um, as a sample size, the number of dice gets larger, um, each sample average is more likely to be closer to the population mean. Um, that would be the 3.5. So as we saw it, it just kept getting closer and closer like that. That peak was more and more at 3.5. Um, and it becomes more and more normal. So in the more, the higher the sample was, so we had 20 dice. If we had 50 dice, it would be even more normal. Um, we'd probably need to zoom in because that would not go very far away from the 3.5. Um, so we have what's called the fundamental theorem of statistics, which more normally is called the central limit theorem. Um, and this is abbreviated CLT. If you write on the AP test because of the CLT, they will know exactly what you're talking about. You don't have to write it out at all. And there will be a point in time on that test where you have to write a court because of the CLC, CLT, blah, blah, blah. And we'll get to the blah, blah, blah in just a second. Um, so what it says, the sampling distribution of any mean becomes more nearly normal as the sample size grows. Um, all we need is for the observations to be independent and random. Um, and this right here is super important. We don't care about the population distribution, the shape of it. Even if it is very, very skewed, what the central limit theorem says is that if your sample size is large enough, the sample distribution will be approximately normal. And so when we're doing things on the AP test that we're going to be learning in the next few chapters, one of the conditions is the distribution must be normal or approximately normal. And so that magic phrase, since the, the observations were independent and random and the sample size is large enough, this distribution will be approximately normal because of the, or by the CLT. Um, 
that is important that saves points. Um, even if you don't necessarily know exactly what you're talking about, that can keep you some points. Um, so, it's surprising a little bit weird. It says the histogram sample means it's closer and closer to the normal model. Um, but again, it's regardless of the shape of the population, you can have an asymptotic population where if you looked at the population itself, it would look like that. Within about a sample size of 20, it's going to be pretty close to normal. It's insane. Um, so the central limit theorem works better and faster the closer it is to normal itself. Obviously, if the population is normal, then each individual sample, like a sample size of one would be normal. Um, but the further away from normal it gets, the bigger your sample size needs to be. Um, but again, a sample size of 20, which is fairly small as far as sample sizes go, is uh, generally sufficient to make even the most skewed and non-normal distribution um, a normal sample distribution. Um, the mean of the random samples is a random variable of sampling distribution can be approximated by a normal model. The larger sample, the better the approximation will be. Um, this looks like that's labeled as what the central limit theorem says. That's not. Um, so the assumptions and conditions, we always have assumptions and conditions. So it needs to be independent. Um, so they need to be sampled independent of each other, which also means randomness. And the sample size must be sufficiently large. What's large enough? Depends on how normal it was, but again, 20 is usually perfectly fine, even if it's completely non-normal to begin with. Um, so we can't necessarily check these directly, um, but the independence, is it plausible? Um, sometimes it'll say it in the problem. Um, we can't use the check for independence like with the equation. We have to look to see like, you know, how did the sampling happen? Does that seem independent? Um, the randomization, it will generally um, say it's a, a random sample, um, or you have to assume it in the problem. The 10% condition um, should be no more than 10% of the population. And again, that's it's drawn without replacement. Generally speaking, it's drawn without replacement. We don't want to sample the same thing twice. Um, when it's bigger than 10%, it just changes the probability a little bit, right? We get that conditional probability going. Um, but again, the population is usually big enough that this is not a problem. And then the large enough sample condition, um, it doesn't tell us how big of a sample we need. Um, we just need it to be big enough, um, which again, if it's like 20 is big enough, um, there's there's never problems where it's kind of close, it's going to be plenty big, or it's going to be super small. Um, so the CLT says that sampling distribution of any mean or proportion is approximately normal. Um, but which normal? So proportions, it's centered at the population proportion, which is P for means it's centered at the population mean which is mu. Um, but what about those standard deviations? We saw the standard deviations of proportions um, a minute ago, but for a normal model, or for, a, uh, for the mean, it's a standard deviation divided by the square root of the sample size. So again, if you want to increase, or if you want to decrease the uh, standard deviation by a certain factor, you have to increase the sample size by the square of that. So if you had a sample size of 20 and you wanted to decrease the standard deviation by one half, then you would need to multiply the sample by four and all of a sudden now you have a sample size of 80, which is a lot bigger. Um, the nice thing about that though is that if you know what you want your margin of error to be, you can get a sample size to make that happen. So, you know, we've talked about in um, the papers and stuff, they'll say that you have a, a sample of 57% plus or minus 3%. You want that to be plus or minus 3%, you can find a sample 
that will make it so that that's at plus or minus three percent. You, it, do you need more people? Do you need less people? Um, but you can figure out how many you need before you ever even take that sample. Um, then the normal model for the sampling distribution of proportion we talked about it's the p times q over n and then square root which the square root could be broken up between the numerator and denominator it's the same thing um, so we have the standard deviation over root n or root pq over root n um, so the variation the standard deviation of the sampling distribution declines only with the square root of the sample size as i was mentioning so again if you want to cut it in half the sample size needs to increase by four if you want to take a third of your standard deviation you need to increase your sample by sample size you have to multiply it by nine um, so as the sample size increasing increases the variability does decrease um, but you can't get it too much otherwise it just becomes um, un like it not not impossible but um, not not particularly i don't want to say easy but feasible not feasible right if you have like a certain budget it's like oh i have a sample size of 20. oh but i really want my standard deviation to be only one third of that size multiply by nine now your sample size is 180. well there's a lot big difference between 20 and 180. um so um to decrease that standard deviation it does does require a bit um, so now we have two distributions to deal with the first one was the distribution of a sample which we made with histograms and stuff like that that's what we've been doing all year especially at the beginning of the year we had a sample we looked at the values in that sample we could make a histogram of that from there we'd find the mean stuff like that um, now we're looking at a sampling distribution where we have a sample we find the mean or the proportion that is the data point that's in this distribution so it's like a distribution of a whole bunch of samples um, and then again we can model it with the normal model because of the central limit theorem um, so it says don't confuse the two generally speaking they don't get confused that much um again this first one is you have a sample you generally know a lot of information about that sample like you might even have the all the individual um data points of the sample the sample distribution you generally know just what the mean or the proportion and the sample size the standard deviation you know just those little pieces of it <clears throat> um always remember that the statistic is a random quantity and it changes from sample to sample right if you were taking sample sizes of 10 people from the school population and we're finding their height this group of 10 will be different from another group of 10. doesn't make one of them right or wrong that's just that um, sample variation um <laughs> Um, there's two basic truths about sampling distributions. Um, they happen because the samples vary. If every sample was the same, we wouldn't need them. Um, and so that's why we get the statistics with all the vary all the variance in there. Um, and although we could sam uh, simulate a sampling distribution, which we did with the average of dice, where we saw it with one, two, three, five, and 20, um, central limit theorem says that we don't need to because it'll be normal as long as that, that sample size is big enough. Um, the parameter, so the, st the statistic changes. The parameter does not. The parameter is the true population proportion or the true population mean it is a fixed value at any given point in time um, now i mean that could change as things change um, like the average height of americans now versus the average height of americans 200 years ago might be different but right now there is an average height of people in america um, and 
this one I almost took this out, but election day is one of the few times we find out the value of the parameter, the true value of what happens. Um, the votes are counted. We find out how good of a job the pollsters did. Not going to touch that one. I'm just going to leave it there. But in theory, that is exactly what happens. Um, sometimes the polls are off. Sometimes they're right on. Um, but we actually know. Um, same thing with the census. Uh, we actually find out what all these values are. So process going into the sampling distribution model. Um, we take a bunch of samples. So we have this sample, which gives us an average of y1. We have this sample gives us an average of y2. We have this sample gives us an average of y3. This is this model right here is that population model. So we have average, we have standard deviation. Notice that this is very much skewed to the right because the tail's pointing to the right. This is skewed to the right. So notice that each of these samples is also skewed to the right. However, what we do is we take the mean of each of those. That's going to be what gets put into the sample distribution. So here, notice we have the mean, the mean, the mean. Those go in. So we take all of these possible samples, go in there, and we get a normal model, which is going to be centered at the mean of the population. Um, so it wouldn't be centered like here, it would be centered closer over to where the mean is, but it's going to be roughly symmetric around it. Um, the more, uh, the, the bigger the sample size, the more normal it will become. So, what could go wrong in doing these? Don't confuse the sample distribution with the distribution of the sample. We talked about that a bit. The distribution of the sample is what we were looking at in um, those first few chapters. The sample distribution is what we're looking at now, where we take this uh, sample and those that data point about the sample goes into what we're talking about. Um, beware of observations that are not independent. They do have to be independent. Independent and random are going to be um, conditions on every single thing we do this entire year. Um, you can't generally check it with your data. You have to think about how the data were gathered. Um, so it's like, you know, it seems like it should be independent. It's not clearly not independent. So we can assume it. Um, or sometimes um, it'll actually tell us, like flat out tell us that we have independent samples of blah, blah, blah. It's independent because of the problem. Um, watch out for small samples from skewed populations. So the central limit theorem says, as long as the sample size is large enough, the sample distribution will be normal. If the population is skewed and the sample size is small, then it might not be enough. Um, however, remember that it doesn't take all that much. Like even with a skewed sample or a skewed population, a sample size of 20 is generally big enough. Um, <clears throat> so what we've learned, learn to model variation statistics um, from sample to sample with a sampling distribution. Central limit theor theorem tells us that the sample distribution of proportions and means are approximately normal for large enough samples, assuming that it was they were independent and random. Um, we've learned that usually the mean of a sampling distribution is the value of the parameter being estimated. So the mean of the distribution of p hat is p, and the mean of the distribution of y bar is mu, not m. Um, it's mu because that's the population mean. Um, the standard deviation is the most important thing other than the center of the mean. Um, the standard deviation tells us how far spread out it is. Um, so a proportion, p times q over n, square root that. Standard deviation is sample distribution um, of a mean. It's the um, standard deviation divided by root n. Um, what if we don't know the population standard deviation? We'll get there. Not this chapter, but we'll get there. Um, 
We learned about the central limit theorem, which is very possibly that most important theorem in statistics, um, which says that the sample distribution of sample mean gets more and more normal um, the larger the sample is, no matter what the population distribution is. So even if it's skewed, even if we know nothing about it, the sample distribution still becomes approximately normal. Um, central limit theorem says happens in the limit. So as the sample size grows to infinity, it will become normal. Normal model applies sooner when sampling from the unimodal symmetric, more gradually when it's non, when it's very non-normal. Um, the vocab in this chapter is is a bit tough because again we have sampling distributions, we have distribution of sample, um, but it it will happen. The AP test will ask you about the mean of the sampling distribution of sample means. That's pretty confusing, um, but this would be sampling distribution of means. The mean of that is going to be mu, just what we saw. Um, I've said this a number of times when describing the shape of sampling distribution. Make sure you say approximately normal. That approximately is a key word. Uh, remember, statistics means never having to say you're certain. Um, so nothing's perfectly normal. Admitting that approximately or nearly or close to or something saying that it's getting there, but not that definitive it is normal. Um, that will cost you points. That takes you from an essentially correct to a partially correct really quick um, for no good reason because you know what you're talking about, but that vocab, that, that approximately, as opposed to making that definitive statement is very important. So um, this was an introduction to sampling distributions of both proportions and means. As I mentioned, there's a lot to look at here. Um, make sure that you're reading the chapter. Reading the chapter is very important. They go over a bunch of great examples um, and have some slightly different explanations in there so that, um, I mean, it's the same stuff, but uh, sometimes coming at it differently is important. So I will see you in class, but until then, keep working problems, keep asking questions, and as always, happy mathing.